Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is our blog radio. We're talking with Michael McFeet today at his home in Queen Village. Michael is an artist, curator, and a natural born critic. In his writings over the years, he has taken a slap at the art world, the corporate world, and the world of politics. In the 1990s, his mass-produced posters for the Secret Heretical Society called for no more ugly murals and for the abolishment of First Friday, among other things. (laughs) (laughs) Michael shows his artwork infrequently, however, but recently he's been in a group show in Chestnut Hill. In April, he had a solo show at Tiger Strikes Asteroid that closed April 29th. Let's talk about your show at Tiger. Uh, It's called Bar Sinister, and it's a show of quiet paintings, I think we can say. Yeah, they're digital uh, images entirely, yeah. They're not painted? Nope. They're made to look like paintings. They sure are. Yeah. Wow. All of my work is on the computer at this point. Okay. Like the um, the sluggo. Yeah, like sluggo. That's part of your... That. Sometimes I work with an existing image, and sometimes I just... Start from nothing. Okay. And in some cases, it's quite photographic. And in other cases, it looks like it might be a drawing. You've got a drawing of Sluggo. I mean, you yeah. know it's from a cartoon, but yeah, it was you an could have drawn it. That, I actually took a photograph of that building. Um, talk to us about the role of pop culture in that show. You have Popeye. Very kind of hard to see. You've got it under some layers. Yeah. I like Popeye. I think <laughs> he's my favorite American philosopher. Between the... <laughs> I am what I am, and it's all I can stand, I can't stand no more. That basically sums up <laughs> my entire approach to everything. <laughs> so what are some of the things you can't stand? <laughs> well, we will take a catalog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are some things I don't, I'm not terribly fond of, obviously, in the oral arts project. Well, are there things in the show that are at... Um, that were at Tiger Strikes Asteroid that that were expressions of things you can't stand? No, maybe uh, expressions of my sense of black humor, I guess. Melancholy of dreams. Uh, the, the role of objects is to restore silence. Yeah, Beckett quote. I love Samuel Beckett. And it made sense. I hadn't shown those sculptures. Uh, I made them in the early 90s, and I never showed them. I destroyed most of that work, and I really like those two pieces. Can you describe them? One is a hinged plywood, almost tongue shape, with uh, rusted finishing nail feet and a rusted hinge. That's 12 feet long. It's 8 feet and then 4 feet up, I believe. Okay, and it rests on the floor? Rests on the floor and leans against the wall. Leans against the wall. Called Scorpion. And the other one is hung from the ceiling on a piece of monofilament. It's called Unbalance. It's an unbalanced 3 8 by 3 8 piece of pine with uh, two Italian rice bags. One that actually goes through the wood and the other one hangs awkwardly, which was fun to center. It didn't occur to me. that was I, I had it on the wall here. Does it spin? If oh, yeah. It spin, well, with the windows open, it's, it marvelously spun all the time like it was, I planned it. <laughs> which in fact I did not but. and and what was the idea it's, it has kind of a trapeze carnival quality you know, yeah, it looks like a trapeze pole a lot of the work I did from that time period I would try to uh, when do you ever get on the table I'm sorry pause for cats yeah uh, a lot of the work I did from that time period I would unbalance literally try to make them as far as being unbalanced without falling over. I did a piece at ICA that was a 12 by 12 inch block of uh, concrete with an electrical cord coming out of it. And a 13 foot piece of rebar, which was as tall as I could stand it up without it collapsing under its own weight. So I did a lot of stuff like that. Things that were almost falling over, but not quite. So it seems like there's some symbolism in what you're making. You talk about balance. I think so. I don't think it's obvious, but yeah, I think so. I mean, I feel it is. It. I think almost everything I've done is somewhat autobiographical. I would say all those trading cards. If you look at them as a whole, you get a pretty good view at the inside of my cranium. Can you tell us about the trading cards? I started doing them when I wasn't really making art. 
uh, at the tail end of the heretical society, I started taking the images of authors, filmmakers, and quotes from them. And I laminated them, and I would just leave them around anonymously, just as tools to make people think about something, you know? Where are some places you left them? Uh, coffee shops, taxis. I would stick them in the plexiglass of taxis, inside of city papers and Philadelphia weeklies, wherever. Uh, telephone booths when they existed. I still make them once in a while, and I, there's over a hundred that I haven't printed in any. So you're a giveaway artist. You were giving it away. Yeah, I was giving it away, and it was anonymous. So it was it was difficult to judge what the response to it would be. But I had to think it was something fairly mysterious. It seemed like something I would like to find myself. Well, they're not quite as text packed as the stuff that you have online. No. I mean, you are no. just voluble. You have reams and reams of words coming out well, all over the place. How many websites do you have? <laughs> uh, it's just the Flickr site and the Facebook and the, the one blog. It feels like a lot. I know. It's a lot of information, probably. Uh, I usually don't write anything unless I feel passionate about it or passionate or angry, usually. Yeah, let's talk about that. The... Um, <laughs> <laughs> The, the heretical society. Let, yes. Let's get into that. that let's, so how did fun. that begin? You know how it began? There was a, an exhibition at Moore College of Art of a painter whose name I think was Keen. And he was doing these paintings for $25 or $50 or something. He was just cranking them out within five minutes. That was just the last straw. That was like, this is beyond the beyonds, you know. I mean, things have gotten so far gone. Was it was it the rapidity or the quality? What what bothered you most? It was it was the quality. It was the uh, insincerity of the gesture. It was the ridiculous fawning over this tactic that just seemed so transparently uh, banal. It was just too much. It was just like this. Is, now now this is completely the complete commodification of creativity. This is beyond now now it, it's and it's rendered it to the price of a box of cereal. You know, this can't go on. This is ridiculous. So we were, we decided to have an exhibition. There was three of us at the beginning, and we kept like trying to come up with a concept, trying to come up with a concept. And the one person just kept saying, "Give them nothing. Give them nothing." And it's like, okay, well, how do you give them nothing? Well, it, we directed people to a vacant lot. That was the first act. Very elegant uh, announcement long on parchment, printed up, and we sent about 300 copies of it all over the place. We had a van and we blackened the windows and we took photographs of people going through the lot. And then it just became mail. We mailed the essays and mailed stuff. I, I, I have this feeling whenever I read your stuff, and some of it is clearly based in fact, that I'm being taken for an incredible ride. Well, that's one of the things. Humor is a big element in my writing and my work. And I think one of the things that a lot of people didn't pick up on with the Radical Society is we were kidding, you know? We didn't really want to melt every bronze in the city of Philadelphia <laughs> as the No More Ugly Sculptors tract and give all the money to the homeless. That wasn't really, that wasn't anything we thought. It was like Jonathan Swift, uh, a modest proposal, proposing that the Irish eat their own children as a way to solve the food shortage and over overpopulation of Ireland. I mean, like, we didn't think people would take it as seriously as they did. It was humorous, and at the same time, it dealt with some issues that probably needed some dealing with. It was fun. We had a great deal of fun. Some of the, uh, some of the phone messages were hysterical. People would call, completely enraged, going off on one thing or another. It, it, was, uh, it was great fun to review them. Where did you get your political leanings? Did you grow up in a household where everybody was talking politics right and left? No, I did not. But I grew up poor, and I think that started it. And when did you become rich? <laughs> there was probably a couple of periods I was comfortable. It's not now, that's for certain. And how did it happen? What, the politics? The richness. The, the, the couple of moments of richness. Oh, I don't know. I just had some good hustles going at the time. 
I want two titles explained because sure. you're very excellent with words and I know that I don't exactly know what you mean. The first is the title of your show that was at Tiger yeah. called Bar Sinister. Bar Sinister is a heraldic uh, designation for proving illegitimacy of birth or bastardy. I've had an oppositional uh, position to the art system for so long that I'd, I'd take that uh, insult away from them immediately. <laughs> I claim it as my own. That was really my thinking. It was also, uh, Simon Bar Sinister was the, uh, the villain in Underdog, the Wonder Dog cartoons. And I know no one would know what it meant. A, a lot of people asked if it was a bar. But I knew I was going to get all that kind of confusion. But I didn't really care, you know. You know, and, and in some ways, I probably shouldn't have done it only because it uh, it confused the issue to what the event was. But I liked it again because of the humor. I thought it was funny. Okay, so now the next one I want explained is the name of your blog. History will absolve Mike. Yeah, that's funny. That was uh, I. I printed a business card that said that. The phrase was appropriated from Fidel Castro's History Will Absolve Me that he wrote when he was in prison the first time. I thought it was funny, History Will Absolve Mike. Well, I had 500 copies. Again, I distributed them all over the place. That was before the trading cards. But I sent 20 copies out to 20 friends of mine, and I got no response. After about a month, I was like, how can there be no response? But I was hearing secondhand that people felt that I was sending them out as a message to them specifically when it had nothing to do with anything except I thought it was funny that I made this arrogant statement that history will, would absolve me. I don't think it would, you know. But uh, So I got no response. That was the be when I began to write. So I wrote an essay explaining exactly what the thing was about. And I sent that to the same 20 people and I received absolutely no response to that. But that was the first time I started writing. I think it was 99. So you have a lot of art on your walls from a variety of people. Yeah. And one of the pieces is from Tom Chimes. And you, t you write about him very movingly on your blog. I like Tom a lot. He was a, he was a very big influence. I would run into him on the street uh, in Center City with my daughter when she was very young. And if I ran into Tom, she knew we were pretty much stuck on the corner of 19th of Walnut for an hour because I would, he would talk, and I just felt so good every time I came away from talking to Tom. I really felt he got short shrift in the community because he really was brilliant, and I think people just kind of dismissed that. as He was also crazy, but he wasn't that crazy, you know. He was really a wonderful person, very generous. In fact, the only work of art he had up in his studio apartment by any other artist was my history rules on my card. That was the only thing. I was so proud of that. And that's why he gave me the painting, which is a set almost the size of the card. It is the size of a business card. Yeah, it's, it's just about that. <laughs> and he brought it to me in a little box that he had made. It was gorgeous. And I was just overwhelmed. So tell us about the Bill Waltons. Below the Tom Chimes piece on the wall, you have Bill Walton. Yeah. I have a lot of Bill's work. We were good good friends, very close. He was a big influence on me. We talked about sculpture a lot. I spent a lot of time with Bill for a long period of time. He was very good, very underrated. And I, I was happy on the one hand that after, after uh, his death, he had a couple of shows in New York and people started writing about it, Roberta Smith, which is all great. But on the other hand, um, why wasn't this going on? while he was alive. And that's the problem in Philadelphia. And I would say with Tom, too. I mean, Tom got a museum show when he was 88. You know, they waited a long time, and they just beat they just beat death to get to him, you know? They didn't. No one beat death to get the bill, and it's a terrible, terrible thing. Tom never got a Pew Grant. Bill never got a Pew Grant. You know, I mean, these people are overlooked. These people are overlooked terribly and not treated very well, I don't think. That's part of my, part of my politics, part of my rage. But if there was two people that I don't mind uh, being associated with, as far as being a loser, it would be Bill and Tom, because they were pretty amazing people. Thank you, Mike. We've been talking with Michael McFeet. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. 
Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.